I will uh, straight away uh, move to welcome uh, His Excellency Mr. Freddy Swan, the Ambassador Embassy of Denmark, who has uh, who has been gracious to come and uh, grace this webinar. So I'll request him to share, give a keynote address uh, to this audience. Over to you, uh, sir. Thank you very much indeed. I hope I'm audible. Can you hear me? Yeah, surely we can hear you, uh, Excellency. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed, uh, and thank you, Willie, for inviting me for this very, very important uh, seminar. I'm extremely pleased to see familiar faces, but also new faces. So that's about how India works, uh, new faces every time, and uh, that is uh, how we can take things forward. I think the workshop or seminar today is really uh, coming uh, rightly and timely. As you will uh, know and you have seen, uh, the President of the European Commission uh, was passing through Delhi the last couple of days. And one of the most uh, important deliverables for the establishment of this uh, new um, Council is really of strategic importance. Uh, only uh, with the US we have a similar Council and this assures that uh, we on both sides, uh, India and the European Union, um, that we are taking this issue to a political level. So uh, free trade agreements, very, very important. Investor, investor protection, very, very important. And all the other trade policy related issues. We can't do anything in any sector, including this uh, sector that we are addressing today, without having kind of common rules, uh, common mutual uh, recognitions and so forth. We all know that uh, the perspective and the potential of an enhanced and increased trade between our two big nations uh, can only happen if we really, really uh, take a top down approach and we are not stopped by, uh, let's say, uh, bureaucracy and technical uh, hindrances. So with this council, I think we have a strategic mechanism that will improve uh, what we are going to do on trade. So hopefully we'll see the free trade agreement in place uh, sooner rather than later. It's highly complicated, but now we have a system in place where we also can have a kind of uh, first hand, um, almost permanent uh, political mechanism that can guide and set out directions for this kind of trade. Let me also highlight the fact that uh, we have all suffered and some are still suffering from COVID. And I think COVID uh, left us with a long lasting, perhaps a permanent uh, kind of memory that health is not something uh, can, that can be restricted to one individual or one community or one nation. It's a global phenomenon. And if we have to address these health related issues and health devices are part of that, then of course you need to have a global at least uh, kind of uh, cooperation that will secure that we can have a free, fair and balanced uh, trade. And uh, so our companies can um, really sell to India. You uh, on the Indian side, you can also sell to uh, Europe. It's very, very important, but we need uh, common standards. We need uh, the same kind of approach. Uh, since I'm the Danish ambassador, I can say we have a number of companies uh, also in, in the, these sectors and they are also here in India. And it's not easy to uh, make a, uh, or uh, to trade with India. You have a lot of obstacles. You have a lot of uh, standards. Uh, some of them are really not meeting the criteria of where we are in the European uh, situation. But what you have here in India is second to none. You are really bringing what I call affordability into the picture. You are also extremely good of uh, defeaturing many of the devices. We have seen so many uh, examples over time where uh, very sophisticated technologies or devices are coming from Europe or the Western part of the world, and they cannot really uh, get into the market of, of uh, India. It's about affordability, resilience, and they have to be extremely robust. So defeaturing is also a part of that, and health has to be something for each and every of us. It's not just for a specific segment and so forth. So with these words, it's just to highlight that we can move forward. We should move forward and we should not just accept things as they are. COVID called upon us, have to do action. We have to work together. And when the new trade and technology uh, council in place, I think we have 
very, very good strategic platforms for securing that we really can take whatever sector, whatever kind of technology to a higher level and we can secure that we can benefit from the skills, the scale of India, but also the skills and the smartness and also the sustainability that we have to think in on all of this uh, together. So we'll have a better, better, better uh, health sector in the future and that people can be treated affordably and that they can get access to even the most basic uh, health care that we uh, need to really to have. Let me also by uh, concluding highlighting one example. A lot of health devices are made out, out of plastic. I think we can all uh, recall that uh, uh, India has now passed 1.8 billion jabs. 1.8 billion jabs and every jab will leave behind a syringe and it's all made of plastic. So we have mountains, even though we have immunized a lot of people, we have also left behind a huge mountain of trash. I was born in the era of plastic fantastic, but today I have no taste for waste. And I think an industry like yours should have really that on your mind. Try to develop sustainable solutions Try to avoid that we are just uh, creating other problems while treating people. And this is really, really important. So I hope uh, all these, uh, these uh, uh, remarks from my side will guide us one way or another. Healthcare is a premium for humanity. And there, you, the industry, we on the political side, regulatory side, we have to take this kind of challenge to us and have to, to uh, really find new directions. So gentlemen and ladies, perhaps a few ladies around here, five S's that should guide us here. Scale of India, skills of Europe, skills of India, speed because we also have to deal with uh, poverty, we have to do with livelihood, we also have to secure that we deliver on the sustainable development goals and scope because what we can do India EU together is hopefully having a scope that goes beyond what we are doing and 50 sustainability without sustainable solutions without sustainability included in each and every part of healthcare sector there's no future we'll just move problems from one part to another part so Healthcare is needed, it's a premium for humanity, and you, all of you, you have a fantastic point of departure for really changing, so we are not coming back to how it was before the COVID situation, and we know many more pandemics will come to all of us. So, gentlemen, don't forget the five S's should guide us. Healthcare is also about livelihood and the way in which we are structuring our uh, collaboration. So with the Trade and Technology Council, we have the strategic mechanism in place also for uh, healthcare sector. Daniel Vance. Thank you, sir, for uh, gracing the webinar and your encouraging words. We'll, I'm sure we'll all draw from uh, your, uh, your remarks that healthcare is for everyone. It is needed and it is supreme. So with that, uh, I'll now request uh, Dr. Stephen Hasselman, uh, Deputy Chief of the Department of Economic and Globalization, Embassy of Federal Republic of Germany to deliver his special address. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Dear Mr. Pandey, Excellency, organizers from European Business Group Federation and organizers from the Medical Technology Association of India, Dear participants, also on behalf of the German Embassy, a warm welcome to, the, to today's webinar. The German Embassy, as all embassies of the member states and the EU delegation support endeavors for increasing mutual trade and investment between EU and Indian companies. And we have to be concrete on where we cooperate in order to get our trade and mutual investment forward. The India and EU are important partners 
there is a wealth of opportunities to cooperate. We have an overall EU-India partnership, and we are working, as everybody knows, on a trade and investment agreement, on a geographical indication agreement. And we also have, in addition, bilateral partnerships between India and EU member countries, one of them being between India and Germany. There's an upcoming intergovernmental consultation in Berlin uh, next Monday. The EU is, as, is one of the largest uh, markets in the world. It has a strong industrial base. It has a strong MSME sector. And uh, India is uh, soon the largest, uh, has soon the largest population worldwide. It is the largest democracy. It has a very strong IT sector. It has a growing medical sector. It has a strong industrial parks um, with a lot of R&D capabilities. And there are a lot of mutual investment opportunities. Healthcare. The demand in India is on the rise. There are high public and private investments in this sector, e.g. by the Ayushman Bharat Health Infrastructure Mission with a volume of 8 billion Euro, uh, US dollars. There's a digital healthcare market. It's rapidly advancing, be it telemedicine, be it uh, health analytics, be it robots used in surgery, be it e-health administration, and so on. Niti Ayok estimates a market volume of India's healthcare sector to rise to 372 billion US dollars in the current year. One important part of the healthcare sector is the medical technology sector. It is, uh, has a lot of issues, cardiological equipment, image diagnostics, orthopedic equipment, equipment for surgery, vision aids, hearing aids, a lot of fields where we can cooperate and a lot of demand and opportunities. There are also some challenges in our mutual relationship and in investments. Uh, which includes uh, questions of licenses, it includes import tariffs, it includes issues of local content requirements, make an India policy, which we welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish today's webinar success in identifying mutual opportunities and finding new partners and in fostering exchange and good relationship between our two, two countries, it's more between the European Union and between India. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for uh, sharing your valuable inputs and uh, for your encouraging words. We are sure uh, we'll take your uh, good wishes for uh, both the groups to, to move forward in trade relations. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to, like to now move on to our panel discussion, uh, which is on strengthening India and European Union's uh, bilateral relationship in healthcare. Uh, I'll request the participants to kindly share if they have any questions in the Q&A box uh, at the screen. And uh, then uh, now I would like to proceed with the session. Uh, before that, uh, I'll introduce uh, our distinguished panel, starting with our Chair and moderator of the session, of the session uh, Mr. Pawan Chaudhary, who is chairman of MTI, CEO of Vigon India, a French multinational medtech company, and wearer of several such distinguished hats. I'll also introduce uh, Dr. Badri Narayanan, advisor and team lead, industry and commerce, Niti Ayog. Uh, Mr. Ashish Jain, who is the CEO of Health Sector Skill Council, HSSC. Uh, Ms. Renita Bhaskar, Minister, Councillor and Head of Trade and Economic Affairs, EU Delegation. Mr. Indranil Mukherjee, Managing Director, B. Brown India. And Mr. Mayur Sardesai, Founder, Somerset Indus Capital. Uh, with this uh, brief round of introduction, I'll request uh, the Chair and the Moderator, uh, Mr. Chaudhary, to kindly kick off the panel discussion. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Nadeem. And uh, it was a pleasure to hear 
Mr. Swain and uh, Dr. Stefan Hesselman. And uh, let me underscore some of the points which were made there. The five S's which Mr. S uh, Swain said, spoke of, scale, speed, skills, smartness, sustainability, and scope. They are very relevant and I was reminded of a time when German uh, machines and German equipment was supposed to be not of great quality. This was as early as uh, end of 18th century, 19th century. And in, in UK, it was said that German quality is not so great. However, you see what a distance it has traveled. And I think that is the optimism which uh, Mr. Freddie Swain was pointing towards when he, sp when he spoke of the fact that what is the distance which India can travel. In several areas, this travel has already happened. In some more areas, it can happen. And with fellow travelers, like the EU, this travel can be uh, expedited. The other point which I liked very much was plastic fantastic was the age when he was, when he grew up. However, he is now left with little taste for waste. And the, the carbon footprint of our consumption is something which is very important for us to take into account for the health of the planet. And I was glad that Dr. Von der Leyen, she spoke about Terra Nova when she met the Prime Minister and at the Raisina dialogue, she spoke about Terra Nova where also she highlighted not only the fact that whatever we do should be sustainable and should allow the planet to breathe, continue breathing. But also she spoke of the possibility of friend shoring. She did not use the words friend shoring, but I think that was implied to do business with countries which have similar democratic systems, similar, similar values, uh, long and shared histories of peace and similar market systems. And EU comes very well in that, uh, in that definition for India. In fact, next month, our prime minister is traveling to both the countries which the key speakers have come from, to Denmark and to Germany, also to France. And it all this exchange points to the fact that friend shoring is really going to happen and in a very big way in times to come. It will replace random offshoring, which was the rhythm so far. So great points made already. And I think on that note, I should go to Renita Bhaskar. I also welcome all the distinguished panelists on, the, uh, on this panel. And, I, I, and after that, I go to Renita Bhaskar and I ask her that Renita, what do you think are the present most important areas of economic collaboration between EU and India? Renita. Okay. Um, very good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon, Pavan and the other panelists and to all those listening in. Um, what are the um, areas of cooperation? I think uh, we would need to extend this um, webinar by another two hours if I had to go and list all the areas of cooperation, which is, I'm sure you don't want me to read out a long, long laundry list, but it suffice to say that our relationships are very closed and close and uh, they cover a wide spectrum of uh, sectors, um, thematic issues, global challenges. So we, from I would say, from clean energy to climate to um, digitalization, information technology, agriculture, you name it. We're cooperating and collaborating on those issues 
and in many cases for many a decade. So I think this is something, uh, while certainly a spring is in the air as far as EU-India relationships are concerned, um, uh, it is also important to highlight that we have been long-standing strategic partners. In fact, um, you know, uh, one of the first, India was one of the first countries with which the EU sort of entered into a strategic partnership. And at that point, there were, I think, only seven or eight in the world. So I wouldn't, uh, we also have a very sort of a broad institutional arrangement in which we engage on many issues. Um, we certainly have a, you know, very uh, robust trade and investment relationship. I don't, I mean, we're totaling to about 100 billion a year of uh, exchanges. Uh, we are one of the largest investors in, in India. So, um, and, and there is already an institutional, it's not that nothing has been done in the past and, you know, and we will just, everything is going to start now. We have an institutional mechanism in place and in particular, the sector where we are discussing, uh, there is also an annual dialogue with, with, with the government of India and, and the European uh, regulators or the European Commission on pharmaceuticals and uh, medical devices, biotech and technology. So there is engagement already. Um, has, it, uh, has it given some results? I think yes. I mean, it's given sort of small results. We keep talking, the more regulators talk and engage, the better it is. Uh, but undoubtedly, talking about, and I, I don't know if that is, maybe I should stop here, Gavin, and ask you, I'll let you ask the next question in terms of, and I think the, um, the Danish ambassador has already alluded to that, but if you'd like, I can then elaborate on some of, um, how do I say, the next phase, what we're going into, and uh, talk about, uh, you know, the, 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 the spring in the air, um, we, can, we can get into that. Great. So I will just come back to you for the spring in the air, and okay. uh, let uh, let let uh, let me uh, go to Dr. Badri Narayan here, and mm -hmm. ask him because of his very wide exposure to various types of technologies and industries. Uh, this broad question as to what are the various areas in which India and EU come can can, can come together uh, productively and synergistically. Dr. Badri Narayan. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, panel and uh, I'm delighted to be with the uh, other dignitaries here. Uh, so on, on this question about uh, the different uh, areas of uh, interest for, uh, from an Indian perspective for, for EU to come in, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Ms. Baskar was telling earlier, uh, we are interested in you know, multiple a multitude of areas in general for collaboration. So we are not restricted to specific uh, uh, areas. Uh, but uh, particularly, um, if, if you really think about the preferences, where, where uh, uh, would we need, uh, which are the areas where we have the maximum complementarities and where uh, Indian uh, Indian uh, industry can gain from uh, EU uh, would be uh, broadly speaking the the, the R and D intensive industries the industries where uh, which are uh, high tech and uh, uh, quite intensive in research and development um, uh, uh, particularly in the manufacturing sector uh, I, I think uh, you uh, uh, most of the audience here would be aware of uh, the PLI. Um, scheme, for example, production link incentives. So we are uh, all those sectors under PLI would be uh, really, really interesting. And all these uh, sectors, um, uh, uh, we, we have a, a lot of incentives uh, for uh, which are directly linked with production for uh, in increasing scale. So we are looking at increasing R&D, increasing uh, our presence in high tech, uh, and uh, and boosting our skills. So uh, in all the industries where uh, uh, you know EU can EU industries can come in and support uh, India, uh, India can be a great destination for that. Uh, if if we actually look at the uh, uh, you know uh, the, the facilitation mechanisms in India for for that, uh, PLA is one example. But there are several other initiatives that have been taken to promote 
uh, your investments. Uh, so I think uh, I would I would keep it uh, very general like this, and as we go forward, uh, probably I can discuss specifically about uh, medtech and 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 uh, things like. That. Thank you. So uh, let us narrow down. Uh, both of you have said that climate change, digitalization, clean energy, R&D intensive in our, uh, industries and industries where, where there is a legacy advantage which uh, Europe has in manufacturing are the best areas for collaboration. Let me go to the people who are actually bringing about uh, these companies, uh, bringing in these companies into India. Let me go to Indranil who's the managing director of Bibron. Indranil, what are the challenges which you face in doing business in India? And also give us uh, in a telegrammatic code, what is your uh, investment in this, uh, in the Indian subcontinent? That means in commerce or in manufacturing, what is the, the picture? And then tell us what are the challenges which you face? So good evening, Pavan, and to all the distinguished dignitaries and the uh, audience here. So first and foremost, um, when we talk about uh, Bibron, so uh, there are three characteristics which which would be very typical of not just Bibron but most of European companies in India, um, and especially coming from a German legacy. First is that uh, we are one amongst those Mittelstand companies in Germany. And um, to put it in an Indian perspective, it's about the MSMEs, which are the strength of uh, Germany, and which is one area where you know India needs to focus on. So that's one. Second is if you look at a typical German organization, and like we are, uh, it's all about innovation. So it's not only about quality; it's about you know bringing in innovation and quite some innovation which we have been able to also bring into the Indian market. And the third is, of course, uh, the topic about sustainability. So before I delve into challenges, yes, um, we are uh, globally a 182-year-old organization, uh, the world's biggest family-owned medtech company. And we have been in India for more than 30 years with close to about 1,000 crores of investment. Um, we have a workforce of close to 2000 plus colleagues working in India and uh, not just uh, bringing in goods from Germany and other European locations, but also uh, manufacturing in India. We have three production entities making a wide range of uh, you know medical uh, products here. So some of the good things before I delve into challenges are we welcome that uh, the medical device rules per se, this, this brings in some order because uh, unlike pharma, the medtech market was not so regulated. So that is definitely a welcome change. The medical device rules that brings in some order uh, into how the market was organized. Uh, we are now talking about the, the ethics part of it in terms of the UCM DMP code, which is also something we take a lot of pride in, in terms of how do we conduct business Opportunities in terms of Ayushman Bharat opening up a wide canvas uh, to reach out to a wider range of people because India is largely an out of pocket healthcare expense market. The National Digital Health Mission Initiative of the government, this is also something which is in sync with the times, how to leverage technology in healthcare. So these have been quite some, uh, let's say, positive progress which we see and which. Uh, continues to motivate us to look in terms of opportunities, how we can grow business in the medtech space. Answering your question, uh, have we faced some headwinds? Of course, I think there's no industry or company which doesn't come across headwinds, but we have had a little bit more fair share of headwinds. Uh, first and foremost is, I think, as, as the world's biggest uh, democracy and, um, you know, this this whole issue between the center and state. Uh, unfortunately, this also brings in a lot of uh, challenges in terms of uh, understanding policy, implementations and interpretations. To just distill it, I'll be a little bit more clear. Uh, if we look in terms of a central uh, regulatory body, CDSU, is something which has been a welcome change in terms of how the medical device market has been regulated, doing a fairly 
really good job in terms of looking in terms of regulations, giving us, uh, making it more transparent, the Sugam portal, making it all online. Gone are the days when we, you know, you have to really queue up. Now what's happening is that while we, we made quite some progressive steps here, some of the things which are pulling it back is we are again now duplicating with a lot of, if I may say so, quasi-regulatory bodies. Legal metrology and the Ministry of Consumer Affairs, this makes it extremely challenging. And today when we are operating in a global supply chain network, if we continue to have lots of challenges from legal metrology, how, um, let's say, a legal metrology inspector in a particular state would interpret labels uh, would be completely different. And that makes it, in today's times, when the uh, supply chain is under tremendous strain, uh, make it difficult to bring products to the market. Uh, second is that um, we, the Honorable Prime Minister has given a clarion call for Atmanirbhar Bharat, which is something we all are committed to. But it's not only about make in India, it's make in India, make for India and make from India. And if we have to make from India to uh, use India also as a base to uh, increase exports, then we also need to look in terms of understanding what are global standards in place and uh, we need not necessarily again come up with uh, local standards um, which could sometimes become barriers and again um, you know if we are talking about eu mdr this is much more stringent than us fda or any of the other uh, uh, let's say norms which are in place the whole transition in europe from mdd to mdr is something which puts patient safety at, at the epicenter of it. So for companies like us, European companies, which are actively investing a lot in terms of this EU MDR, to again come up with some, uh, let's say, local standards, this also then puts up a tremendous strain in terms of optimizing the portfolio and would also limit our ability as a country you know, uh, to, to really avail opportunities on a global scale. So this is just one example where um, when CDSC has done it so well, do we really need so many quasi-regulatory bodies? And this uh, becomes a challenge. Uh, the interpretation between center and state, uh, we have, I mean, the transparency which we see in the center is unfortunately lost in the political dialogue between the center and state. And we are facing those issues uh, as well in terms of these interpretation. The third is, um, if we look in terms of uh, our country where the reliance on import of medical devices is as high as 80%, um, needless to say that uh, how we as a country responded during COVID in terms of, uh, you know, uh, developing the base in India. We also then need to understand that we can only do it in a structured phase-wise manner. So, while it is very much uh, a good intent, because we are talking at the end of it, why do we want to reduce this import dependency is also with the whole affordability, accessibility and availability issue. And then if we have uh, something like a health says, which, which then further adds on to the cost, we have GSTs which are significantly higher. At the end of the day, in an out-of-pocket expense country, then this only adds up onto the cost. Now, part of it, of course, can be regulated by, by price controls, which, which have come in. But there again, um, you know, there were already, let's say, quite some good amount of work with, with the commission uh, looking at TMR. But again, this is something which is not seen the light of the day. It is seen partially for some of the essential devices in COVID. But again, here, the core issue is about getting predictability from a policy perspective which helps us when we drop investments on a mid to long term scale. Correct. So these are some of the challenges. Of course, what still keeps us interested is that the per capita consumption is so low. The market is so huge. The availability of, uh, you know, the possibilities to look in terms of technology where India is a global uh, a powerhouse. How can we leverage that expertise also brings in the Indo -US, uh, EU cooperation and many more possibilities to explore. Great. So basically you are saying that center state uh, issues are surely there, but uh, also perhaps you are alluding to the fact that the circle of probity, which is expanding surely from the center, 
has not fully reached the states. And, uh, but that is also a very positive development that the circle of probity is expanding. The quasi-regulatory bodies need to be trimmed. The standards have to be aligned globally. The tariff barriers have to be reduced. And if price control has to come, then it should come in a manner which does not question the viability of the industry. We are all for affordability. Absolutely. We are all for accessibility, but we also need to uh, be viable to be able to continue to provide our services. And you are also saying that the headroom for growth is so high. And with schemes like Ayushman Bharat coming and now the prime minister saying that we will bring the missing middle also into the game. Uh, we feel that there is a very strong possibility. In fact, we are the first association which made any med tech company from Europe or, um, or uh, US uh, no, uh, approaches to check whether uh, we should come into India and we are saying that, yes, you should surely come. There will be challenges, but the uh, sea is very promising and the horizon is bright. So great points, uh, uh, Indranil. Thank you very much for uh, rounding off this, uh, this point so well. Let me come to now a point regarding services. So we were speaking about products so far, Renita, you and uh, Badri Nara and all of you spoke about the products. Now let me come to services and ask Ashish. Ashish, what do you think is the uh, scope for heal in India and heal by India? Now, uh, particularly the latter or both. What is the role of skill development for heal in India and heal by India? Ashish. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chaudhary, and uh, good evening, uh, my co-panelist, and good evening to uh, His Excellency and Dr. Stephen. Uh, I think in terms of the opportunities for skill development, uh, you know, whatever area we work, I think skills is something which are required to make anything successful. Uh, you know, we are talking about technology, we are talking about medical, uh, med tech, medical devices, assisted devices, so and so forth. But I think to make them successful, as uh, you know, I could see Indranil talking about various issues. Of course, these are of regulatory nature, but in terms of making those equipments worth being adopted in the market also requires skill sets by the people in the country. And only then the adoption is much easier and the faster, which goes to the uh, grassroots in that sense. Uh, I would say in terms of the skilling, if you look at uh, from the perspective, uh, we uh, we are talking about digital health today. And I think you just referred to Aishman Bharat and you have spoken to about uh, how this middle piece is going to be part of the Aishman Bharat as well. So tr the opportunity is huge and so is the opportunity. So is the requirement of the trained and skilled workforce is there. You know, we need to cater to large number of uh, people in the country which will require again the large skilled workforce uh, to cater to what we are looking at and i'm very happy to note that uh, while his excellency mentioned about 5s i think four which is scale sustainability scope and speed actually all need skills so fifth s is very important from the perspective that you know all can be done by technology but at the same time with the skills as well uh, for skilling in these different sectors today, like we, you know, this is the what we're talking about: digital health, artificial intelligence, etc., 3D printing, uh, devices. Uh, what we are looking at: how can the professional healthcare professionals be trained into it? How can they help in the adoption of these, you know, uh, these new technology? And I must admit this, you know, going forward, the future is technology only. Without technology, I think. Uh, there will be no healthcare delivery going forward. So healthcare delivery and the technology would go hand in hand. And this also brings in point which is also referred, uh, you know, about the affordability and the accessibility of healthcare. And it also bring in the accuracy in terms of what we are looking at uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, the outcomes, the patient outcomes and the quality of healthcare delivery, which is going to happen. Uh, on our side, you know, to understand what the market should be, what kind of skill development would be required, what kind of skills would be required specifically, what we had started working on is we had uh, recently constituted a committee which is looking at the uh, future skills and the health tech in those areas. What are skills required? And we are uh, conducting a study also on this. Uh, we have been zeroing down on key skills which are required. 
by the healthcare professionals and not only by the healthcare professionals by the technology experts also so i think in this area we need two sets of people one a healthcare expert who understand technology and technology expert who understands healthcare as well so there is there has to be some continuum between two because till the time we can you know bridge this uh, thing between two either healthcare expert or technology expert i think we'll not be able to get the right skill set which will help which will actually delay the adoption etc for us which we already seen uh, i think what we also could look at in terms of going uh, you know in looking at the skill set is how do we involve more and more healthcare professionals uh, getting into uh, you know developing new technology developing the medical devices uh, which will also happen which will help us in getting the faster adoption of this See, i'll give you a very very simple example nothing about technology not too much of technology oriented if you talk about electronic electronic health record today the adoption is quite low in india if you look at from the ehr perspective you know emr perspective for the simple reason probably the doctor doesn't have enough time to actually feed into the entire data into emr so how can this be done quickly how can this be adopted by the physician who is looking at the patient can this be minimized can the technology be developed so that uh, you know uh, so that he or she doesn't feel uh, you know saying uh, you know too much of time is consumed in doing this can we create people who will help them get this uh, done quickly uh, similarly we have spoken we have seen in the era of covid you know a uh, very small example of technology again we had seen that everybody is looking at uh, teleconsulting now you know we had seen teleconsultation growing multifold across the globe not only in india and if you look at the pre covid area i think uh, including you and some of us also on the panel today the first thing we wanted to if you want to consult a doctor it is all a physical meeting which we prefer to have we will always prefer to meet our doctor you know face to face talk to him or her find out uh what are the challenges how can we look at what will be the you know uh, how it will be taken forward but i think after covid post covid what are during the, now what we are looking at it has given us the acceptability of the tele consultation and as you mentioned about skill set so every doctor today is forced to actually train themselves how to use simple let's say even zoom for that matter which they may not be aware earlier or how to do consultation on zooms today or how to actually set up a zoom call or how to set up this you know tele call how to have their own apps to do this tele consultation today so if you look at across the country today the number of apps for each private doctor has multiplied multifold each doctor somehow have their own apps to do either through some uh, you know uh, portal or they have their own things where they doing this so what i'm trying to make a point is that if we is to have technology if we want to bring in med tech which is going to help the patients definitely in bringing the affordability accessibility also the scope what we talking about i think we need to involve the healthcare professionals from the beginning itself while the technology is being adopted and probably both had to work together both side healthcare and technology side to see that how this adoption the process of adoption becomes much easier and smoother for healthcare professional and they don't feel threatened by the way you know this is something which has come to them how would they use this technology now uh, so that's that's where i stop right now yeah. and for anything i will take it forward from there thank no, you no no i think i think you have beautifully brought a new point into the game and a very vital point that healthcare needs experts who understand technology and technology needs experts who understand healthcare and this is very true you spoke about zoom uh, calls not being a familiar mode of operation for the doctors so he had to acquire learning let me tell you some doctors uh, in many parts of the world have told me this excel sheeting and uh, uh, putting all the data in excel is too much for me i am basically a surgeon or an anesthesiologist i understand the machines i do not want to get into the software etc and this was Uh, a forced learning on them and it was very very vital i also feel we need some sociological experts because when you speak about missing middle we can have the uh, ayushman bharat or insuring uh, insurance program for missing middle but it should also accept it nhs got very well accepted in uk as you would know because just prior to launching of nhs in uk there was the world war 2 where there was a lot of bombing which used to happen on england and the rich and the poor had to come together in the bunkers so the behavioral boundaries 
and the civic sense boundaries. They became sensitive to each other. They also learned from each other, which is why when NHS came, the middle, the upper, the lower, everybody accepted it. So we need to bring in some sociological experts also so that our program, when it extends to the middle and upper classes, is also accompanied with certain behavioral sensitization to each class about the others and bringing in that civic sense in the hospital uh, to make it more effective. Great points, uh, Ashish, and uh, uh, let me just go to Mayur. Mayur is the man who brings the money on the table. And, and that is really very, very important, whether it is coming from global destinations or local destinations. And Mayur is also very keenly associated with the world of healthcare. So let me ask him, Mayur, since you run a primarily healthcare-based fund, what are the global uh, investments destination? Is India uh, 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 an investment destination for uh, global funds in the healthcare space? And if yes, uh, whether in medtech or not, and if in medtech, then which particular space is in medtech? Mayur. Right. Thanks, Pavan, and uh, good evening to all the participants and panelists. Um, I think uh, we as a fund, uh, we, we run a fund called Somerset Indus Capital Partners, which invests in the healthcare space and across the healthcare space. So it's pharma, medtech, diagnostics, hospitals, nutrition, digital health, the whole, whole gamut. And we've done about 14 investments on the ground. But a, a few of them have been in medtech. I mean, we've done about five or six investments in, in, in medtech and across the spectrum, uh, critical care platforms, tier two platforms, uh, digital uh, imaging, uh, renal care consumables, uh, digital health, all, all these spaces. So we've, we've sort of experienced uh, a lot of what you have, you have said uh, among the panelists before. And, and I think we believe that there is, there is a real great play to be had in medtech going forward. We've been bullish on it for from since the time we sort of created the fund about ten about a decade ago, and we believe this because we see a very strong parallel uh, between what pharma has achieved in India and and what medtech could go in that direction. I think uh, pharma, if you see today what size and scale it is, and it is through the whole branded generic route, and it started out with you know just sort of MNC is getting in, into play, but in the mid 70s to early 80s, Indian companies got in, they started out as distributors, built out as, as companies, went into manufacturing, doctors accepted that those kind of products, the markets got penetrated deeper. And today what you see in sort of Indian pharma is, is a composition of MNCs and domestic players who sort of control a large portion of the market. And not just in India, but even the Indian players go started in the ROW markets, went into semi-regulated markets and then regulated markets. And, and that sort of play started probably in the early 80s till, till today. And you're talking about a 40, 45 years back. Uh, I think medtech, we see going a very similar route. Uh, we are seeing MNCs, which are there going, building out, penetrating. We're seeing Indian companies sort of building out. And I, I like the word which was presented by the ambassador said, de-featuring of products. I think we see that to be the key to really uh, building Indian medtech. Uh, you need products which are right sized and right price. I think that is the key to really building out. And I think India as a destination can provide that uh, base, creating those products. So there is a huge group of innovators we see in India at the startup level who create those kind of products because Getting the price right is sort of intrinsic in, in their developmental DNA. Uh, I think they do that. We've seen commercial platforms sort of hungry for those kind of. Uh, can Indian uh, sort of in the ecosystem and medtech provide a base where there are commercial platforms and they could be the MNC platforms, they could be the Indian platforms which are building out, collaborating with these innovators who come up with these kind of products. I think that's where I think the, the market is going. Manufacturing, I think, is, is something which is which is definitely coming of age. It's taken time. I mean, if you really ask us, we, uh, our thesis was probably 
medtech was going to go scale up much faster uh, it hasn't happened so and i think there are two reasons for it one is i think all of you have talked about things of access and affordability i think access has been created by the healthcare infrastructure on the ground that has gone from fairly deep if you see even lower tier markets etc you will see a fair bit of infrastructure both on the government side to some extent on the private side you see accessibility created even by technology but i think the biggest challenge we face in india is because it's a self pay market affordability is a big big challenge and there is where insurance programs whether it's private insurers and especially the government programs which operate in the lower tier market i think they make a huge impact in terms of providing that affordability and that generates scale what we've seen is, and just to give you an example uh, we have hospital groups operating in the lower tier markets and what we've seen is ayushman bharat state government panels all these help capacity utilization in these hospitals and medtech is 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 a sort of a slight delay to you know uh, the whole process of you know the healthcare delivery getting on the ground and the scale of medtech we believe is is now coming in where you know between the upper tier and lower tier we we have enough scale coming into the market and and manufacturing basically happens only when you have real scale around so i think that that is something which is which is happening now and and we are fairly bullish that this will this will translate into you know Uh, metre india being a, a a big destination for medtech uh, going forward if you ask me what will work in the indian context i think it starts off from the lower to the upper tier it starts with consumables uh, that sort of works very well uh, i think areas like imaging uh, you know pathology and that whole area uh, work very well but i think another whole area which is coming into play is the whole early diagnosis and screening so point of care devices etc because that is where uh, the country needs to focus on and i, I think covid has has really given that whole sector a fillip uh, saying can we really screen early can we detect early uh, can we treat early i think that's that's the sort of place uh, uh, which which we believe that you know will really play out uh, in terms of building a scaled medtech sector uh, I, i think that that that's that's the space which we, which are bullish on and i think in manufacturing uh, the things like we have the atmanirbhar uh, uh, schemes the pli schemes etc they will definitely help uh, support manufacturing because a lot of manufacturing requires some initial scale to be brought into the system and these schemes do help uh, we we've seen similar things happening in in the pharmaceutical side on the apis side uh, where pli schemes have, have started becoming effective i think uh, the same sort of concept will work in in medtech And 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 we'll sort of need to similar kind of uh, uh, advantages in the set. That that's where we are. Great. So uh, I like that the featuring point which you got from uh, Freddie Swain's uh, talk. That was a very good point in the kind of unraveling the product and then reducing the features and then coming at a price point which is more acceptable and the 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 product does the bare minimum which is required. Uh, great. and uh, mayur i'll come back to you with a point that what is the chance of a software as medical device uh, kind of firms in the indo eu space can we benefit from what is happening there i'll let you have the last word on that but before that let me go back to ranita and ask her if there is anything th that she would like to add to how the indian landscape can be a preferred destination for european medtech and uh, the reforms which are happening in medtech in uh, in europe in uh, medical device business environment how are they going to affect uh, this overall medtech space so uh, renita and after that i will come for a couple of minutes to each of the each of the panelists to have their last thoughts on uh, topics related to medtech um renita yeah thanks very much pavan so i'm going to sort of answer parts of your question and also take pick up some other elements that that came up in the in the, the uh, discussion uh, first of all to say um just to mention again that you know we um 
uh, and I'd like to focus the, the next part of what I'm going to say in, on um, how do we create this enabling environment, I think, for EU India trade and investments in the sector um, to, to, to really take off. Um, it's good what's happening right now, but clearly there's the scope of doing more and, and, and much better is, is completely untapped. So we have two, we have, you know, we have uh, two sort of mechanisms that have been sort of blessed by our leadership. One is the, um, the FTA track, um, where we're going to be starting negotiations. One is an investment protection negotiation. The GI negotiation does not matter, but these are sort of two tracks of negotiations that should, um, uh, should, should create conditions, a more stimulating environment for trade and investment if we are successful in taking them through all the way. Um, some of the issues that I think Indranil has mentioned, and I think also the, the last uh, speaker, Mayur, has mentioned in terms of, uh, and what I took note of is some, why has manufacturing in India, as some of the speakers have said, India today still imports about 80% of its medical devices. Clearly, that's not a very happy figure. I think, um, and it's fully understandable that India wants to increase its manufacturing base of medical devices in order to serve its growing population and its growing needs. So that's a fully sort of understandable conclusion that one can draw from that number. But I think the question that we have and often in the discussions is that how do you do it in a manner that really enables you to make step changes in increasing the manufacturing base and doing so in a sustainable manner, uh, keeping in mind things like affordability, patient care, continuity, um, you know, making sure that the quality care, uh, the, you know, the, that, that, you know, the, the market side, Indian, the Indian market is in, integrated with the global one. These are some of the issues, I think, uh, that, that, uh, that, that need to be taken into account in this path. I think some of the speakers have also mentioned things like high import duties, some of the non-tariff barriers that um, that European companies face. And often on the ground, while not intended, there is some sort of a discriminatory practice sometimes towards foreign uh, partners. Uh, we have issues on intellectual property enforcement and this whole issue of standards and local content rules in procurement, you know, in, in government procurement. So um, how can these be tackled, I mean, between friends and strategic partners in a way that, that, uh, that, that, that you know, that, that um, helps meet India's goal of uh, increasing its manufacturing base and also helps in uh, us to French shore, as you, uh, as you mentioned, and also facilitates trade and investment. And I think this is what we would like to solve. Some of these issues are solvable in an FTA context, notably the duties part of it, things, some of maybe the procurement rules, perhaps some of the IPR rules, but there are still many issues that may not be tackled in, in, a, um, uh, in an FTA context. Notably things that require more time in terms of uh, discussion on standards, in terms of other elements, I think that the speakers have not mentioned, such as, you know, we talked a lot about services in the medical uh, devices sector and this whole untapped issue of data flows and establishing an environment wherein uh, data, there can be free flows of data with trust. Uh, these are some of the issues I think that will have to be discussed outside the FTA scope. And in that context, the Trade and Technology Council, I think, is a welcome step wherein um, we can have privileged engagement with Indian, um, uh, you know, steered at the highest political level and, uh, and, and, and on uh, creating, uh, tackling some of these issues that bring about an enabling environment. Um, I, that's what I would like to say from, uh, at, you know, at this point in time. I know it doesn't completely answer your your question in terms of uh, but i thought this important to mention that uh, um, you know the enabling environment is key to get that investment uh, started 
I, I don't think it is an issue of, uh, you know, a simple sort of a PLI scheme in terms of, yes, that helps. But what we need to look at, you know, if we really want this partnership to deepen and go to the next level, is to think bigger and broader. And the many of the issues that are hampering manufacturing today in India, I, I think they are they are not related to uh, very much to how do I say foreign trade. They're, they're they're very internal to the country, and they require an internal you know um, reassessment. Um, and in that context, I think on some of these discussions, on some of these issues, notably on standards in terms of sharing of best practices towards IPR enforcement, in terms of engaging on, on the issue of data flows. Those are topics where I think a greater and closer collaboration between the EU and India can certainly help. I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. No, I think you, know, very, you have added a very frank uh, dimension to this. And you have said it very tactfully also which is how we have to handle the issues, as you said, between friends and strategic partners. If we gloss over the fact that there are no problems, and then the somehow, you know, we have kind of uh, put a flag, uh, a flag of everything reconciled, triumph, whereas the embers are burning beneath. So very soon the flag will catch fire. But what you are saying is we have to look at deeply these points and there are not many points. And once we do that, we know how to resolve differences between friends. And uh, standards, by the way- Yeah, I, yeah I add one more thing there, Pavan. And I would yeah. just want to say is that, you know, as, as uh, we, we're sort of policy makers and when we engage with the government of India, we, we, we engage with other regulators and policy makers. But at the end of the day, I mean, what we can do as governments is that we create an enabling environment. We definitely cannot force businesses to invest in one way or the other. And I think that is something that should be sort of understood and sort of uh, and, and, and seized is that let us try to create this enabling environment. And as much as, you know, I mean, our views are clear. We are in terms of we are in India for the long run. This is a longstanding partnership. We believe this. There is something we can, you know, and in the current global context, it just makes so much more sense for these things to happen. But having said that, it is finally businesses and investment funds like Mayur and the others who are taking these decisions and they're taking it on a basis of objective criteria. And there, I think India needs to be mindful where, while it's a fantastic market, there are some issues that need to be tackled really to, how do we say, um, to, 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 to get over that hurdle and take its rightful place and that, I think, that is the choice that has to be taken internally. We are there as a long-standing partner of India. We want to work with India in, in creating this enabling environment. But one needs to be mindful that it's a very competitive world out there. And investment choices are made by private firms that look at a lot of criteria, which as a policymaker, I might not like. I mean, it's not a comfortable position for me, but that's how the real world works. And I think that's something that needs to be sort of factored in and guide our, our, our discussions as policymakers. I'll, I'll you know, I cannot tell you how strongly we resonate with you. In fact, MTI as a body has brought in the highest FDI into the country every year. Uh, uh, and in fact, FDI forms 80% of the total investment into the sector. And roughly 80% of that comes from MTI companies only. And secondly, we are at the forefront for the last five years uh, for resolving so many issues of the European, American, and Japanese companies with the government. So we, again and again, we come to this conclusion which you have drawn so beautifully today that we cannot force uh, an investor's hand. We have to attract him. It has to be a pull 
because of the the circumstances which we provide because of the behavior which we provide because of the speed of service which we provide as a country for his uh, investment to flower great points i i i i really like what you have said on that note let me go to dr badri narayan and ask him dr badri narayan what is it that the government is doing to ensure greater receptivity to expression of differences which might be there between friends or between friendly nations of india uh, and uh, how are we addressing uh, the issues which are coming up i hope this is not too difficult a question for you you are doing it every day dr badri narayan and i i really ask you uh, as a fellow indian and a fellow traveler rather than put, trying to put you on a spot in this dr badri uh, thank you mr chaudhary uh, absolutely i think uh, we uh, uh, have been uh, as as we all know here as we speak we have relaunched the, the india Uh, EU uh, free trade agreement, and it's not only free trade agreement, but also the investment protection agreement, uh, geographical indications. So uh, we have, a, like, like Ms. Ba Ms. Baskar mentioned uh, very uh, uh, emphatically. So we have had a very uh, you know, close relationship and a lot of uh, trade and commerce investments happening over time. Uh, it's not that. we are starting something afresh but uh, this uh, this this current uh, set of negotiations that we are having uh, they are uh, uh, they are pretty much in the spirit that you mentioned so we are both friends we are we have a lot of things um, that are common to each other and uh, principles that are similar um, and uh, we are looking at the economic benefits that we can bring to each other so so definitely uh, we we have to think about all these uh, issues and uh, in with the experience that we got from a uh, recent conclusion of free trade agreements with uh, countries like uae and australia um, what we have been learning over time is that uh, like like you also rightly articulated uh, take up the the, the low hanging fruits and uh, go very quickly uh, things that 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 are that are kind of uh, uh, very easy for both sides to agree uh, and then come to the more difficult things and in when it comes to the more difficult things we are uh, obviously going to have some give and take like if i do this what 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 additional uh, uh, you know concession that would uh, you give us and so on so i think that is that is one thing and another uh, aspect uh, that i think that that uh, uh, answers most of the concerns in terms of tariffs and non tariff any great great points i think you you have uh, understood what we were wanting to ask you and you have replied very well that the spirit of the dialogue will continue uh, in the, uh, in the genre or let me say uh, uh, with with a flavor of friendship as we were uh, speaking uh, great uh, i will ask now ashish and indranil to come in with any last minute points which they have and uh, then go to uh, the or let me let me go with the question itself to indranil indranil one of the question which has come from uh, bhaskar is that acceptability of products made in india in 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 europe how it can be enhanced uh, because there are uh, uh, there are issues which are exports face would you like to quickly answer that uh, indranil yeah so i i think it's a very pertinent and relevant question but uh, the answer is also in terms of what i mentioned about the standards so one challenge which of course uh, um, companies from india face is uh the ce accreditation which which you know uh, itself has undergone quite some change and um prior to mdr we had the mdd the medical device directive and we had uh, let's say some notified bodies in europe which itself are uh, not been able to qualify for an ongoing ce accreditation under eu mdr 
because as i said eu mdr is much more comprehensive it's much more stricter in terms of patient safety and that's where um the ce accreditation would be a let's say a basic qualifying criteria which then if we have different standards um in let's say in india compared to what we have in europe that might become then a stumbling block and this is where uh, without getting into you know there are some well established companies in india who have a good export base but uh, come june then this could suddenly impact significantly their ability to continue with those exports so right. this is i would in a nutshell say that one of the reasons why there should be a harmonization of standards and not standards coming up as a trade barrier great now let me come to um, ashish ashish would you like to add your last minute uh, on how there can be greater exchange of healthcare working professional hcws between india and uh, europe or india and the west uh, and what will you do in the training space to make this happen ashish thank you so i would uh, you know quickly uh, respond in this manner that you know probably this is the platform like you mentioned uh, the mti members uh, actually looks at the 80% of the import which happens in the country uh, so probably i will use this platform to request the medtech companies and the mti members to reach out to us and let us know what are the priority skill areas for them and we through the ministry of skill development and entrepreneurship Uh, and the healthcare sector skill council we can actually uh, help them create those skilled workforce in the country because i heard uh, renita talking about uh, saying devices could be exported but at the same time probably uh, you know i don't know how many skills could you export how many skilled person could you export from uh, you know import from other countries so probably skills have to be uh, developed within the country skilled people have to be developed within the country uh, i am using this uh, you know inviting all the entire members to reach out to us let us know uh, what are the priority skill areas both and uh, skill areas could be in two areas one in the manufacturing side and other is in the uh, the uh, skills in the services domain so whichever areas they have the skills please uh, let us know through mti mti can become the uh, you know the the collector uh, of all these information which can be shared to us and we'll be happy to work along with mti and the uh, you know respective companies to deliver you know create those skill sets and deliver training along with those uh, medtech companies i say thank you great so we we train more than 250000 healthcare working professionals in the hospitals every year and in fact all the training in all technologies is done by companies only as you know because the textbooks cannot catch up with uh, the movement of technology and it will be great also if the ladder of learning is aligned with the global ladder because many of our healthcare workers go to foreign countries their learning should continue uninterrupted even when they are abroad and when they come back so this is our request uh, request to you and in the manufacturing space uh, companies like bibron bd and so many others which are strong in manufacturing in india they have the largest footprint they are the crucibles of learning and uh, dissemination of learning mti also conducts certain programs in manufacturing for manufacturing techniques dissemination which we will keep you uh, informed about lastly let me come to um let me come to mayur and ask him about the software as medical device space because this is an emerging area about which we would like to learn from him regarding the attractiveness uh, commercially uh, for this sector among investors uh mayur yeah so i think software is emerging as as a way of uh, of uh, providing enablement in in, in medtech as well as creating access uh, and 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 that's something which uh, uh, investors have started recognizing uh, i think uh, software and technology just on its own doesn't work it works as more as an enabler to create that and we've seen that in in so sort of you know uh, if you see tele radiology as a way forward that you can create significantly large platforms based on that Uh, and a pan india platform we have a company uh, in diagnostics for krishna diagnostics which which is pan india but based on tele radiology and tele pathology similarly we've seen an eic where you can use technology to really to uh, provide critical care that deep enough now 
earlier people would just sort of say you know we will we will not look at the software part but we've seen investments so just uh, just about a few months ago uh, uh, one eicu software cloud physician uh, did get funding and, and we see we see man, many more of these kind of examples but i think it's coming more of age because you know a few factors have played played their role one is people are seeing that you know you cannot penetrate into lower tier markets without using technology i think uh, uh, the scale of the market basically uh, makes these kind of uh, uh, softwares uh, interesting uh, i i think that is 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 something which people really look forward because then it's a business proposition to uh, to work around and and going forward i feel that uh, people will be able, able to provide sort of saas kind of uh, uh, products in in in, in even in medtech which will allow for that scale to happen because especially when you go into lower tier markets uh, what you are providing is a solution you are not providing a product you are not providing a service you have to provide whatever it takes to make that solution and and uh, and healthcare delivery happen and i think that is where you know a lot of this thing uh, these kind of aspects play a role so i think as as you said you know it, it's service it's it's products but it's also technology which which includes software that is it's a combination of all this and we've seen this happen we've got a company called genworks which is a lower tier business it's a g created lower tier distribution platform i mean it the, the whole premise of it is is the technical technical solutions based uh, uh, so, uh, products and service delivery because in the lower tier markets where it operates i mean each each Uh, your customer is unique in terms of what problem he faces and you have to basically go there and say how can i solve his his issue to provide him so that he buys my products and 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 and, and builds around so i think that that's where uh, that's where the real aspect uh, will come into play great superb point there was one last question i let me cover it in uh, my closing remarks this was regarding the energy intensive uh, intensiveness of hospitals and the supply chain and their carbon footprint we are aware of this in fact we are engaged with a scandinavian hospitals uh, hospital chain company which sets up hospitals in this area and uh, they are very concerned about it the some of the some of the recommendations they make is about having smaller hospitals uh, distributed around the urban tissue which is also something which has come up after the pandemic uh, and also they focus uh, very strongly on waste disposal in such a manner that the carbon footprint is reduced but we can discuss this uh, surely in greater detail offline with the questioner uh, let me now come to the close of the session and thank all the panelists they brought in such relevant points and so uh frankly and yet tactfully and i think i should also uh end on that note and i am reminded of uh, how the status of the businessman has changed in the world if you remember napoleon bonaparte pointed towards uk and said to his people that let us defeat this nation of shopkeepers that time that means businessman was not at the center of economic activity uh, the bigger people were or the more important people were the generals because they were conquering new areas the bureaucrats who were distributing uh, the spoils of uh, uh, power etc and administering however in recent times the businessman has come to the heart of the socio economic activity and we, this has happened all over the world so mti in its humble capacity tries to get a very good seat or at least a seat for the businessman on the tables of power and uh, if if we will get greater support from everybody in this area we will be able to prove to be an attractive destination where which is which which has its own challenges but these challenges can be so uh, well overcome because of the receptivity which the businessman gets here the friend shoring uh, model also has as a corollary a china plus 1 manufacturing destination which the west requires in asia 
China plus one because uh, because of IP rights, because of how things have gone in the last few years, the Chinese model, the Chinese uh, soil may not be trusted by everybody equally. So if we are among the most trusted partners, or if we are going to emerge as the, among the most uh, trusted partners of the West and Japan, we need to also be the most receptive partners of the West and Japan. And I'm sure uh, then those dialogues will happen, which uh, really will sort out the creases and greater, even greater investment flows we can expect in times to come. So on that note, I would like to close the session. Thank you very much, gentlemen and lady for joining us. And thank you, uh, MTI and EBG for organizing this uh, seminar. And I'm getting, somebody is saying very insightful session. Thank, so thank you very much for that compliment also. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.